With a population of a little under a thousand residents, Plainfield, Wisconsin is a small, tranquil farm town with friendly people and quiet streets. Driving through town, it's hard to imagine how a normal place like Plainfield could become the backdrop for one of the most dark and disturbing stories in the history of true crime. It was here, in the 1950s, that a quiet man named Ed Gein shocked the nation with his sick and twisted crimes. Over the course of 10 years, Gein snuck into local cemeteries at night and dug up as many as 10 women without ever getting caught in the act. In this video, I visit all of the crime scene locations and tell the true scary story of Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield. I also visit two cemeteries where Gein robbed graves and share the tragic events that led to his arrest and the gruesome discoveries in his farmhouse. Ed Gein was an evil man who committed heinous acts that defy comprehension, but was he born evil or did he become a monster later in life? Although Gein could have been born evil, his terrible childhood and unhealthy attachment to his abusive mother was likely the driving force behind his disturbing crimes. Ed Gein will forever be linked with Plainfield, Wisconsin, but his life actually began in the city of La Crosse, a little over 100 miles west of Plainfield. Edward Theodore Gein was born a second child in 1906 to George and Augusta Gein, who owned a meat market at the corner of Charles and Gillette Street. The original building was torn down a long time ago, but in 1909, the corner lot was the site of the A. Gein meat market. The young Ed Gein lived in a house on Wood Street with his older brother Henry and two parents, and while the family business kept a roof over their heads, home life for the two boys was far from normal. Ed's mother Augusta was a fanatically religious woman who was extremely controlling and unaccepting of anyone outside of the family, especially women. The two boys were not allowed to make friends with kids at school, and they were forced to live by their mother's strict moral code. Ed and his brother suffered years of mental abuse by their unhinged mother and physical abuse at the hands of their alcoholic father, George, who everyone in the home despised. In 1914, the Gein family sold the meat market in La Crosse and moved into a secluded farmhouse on 200 acres in Plainfield, Wisconsin. Ed Gein would end up living in the house for over 40 years until his arrest in 1957. In 1940, after 26 years of alcohol abuse, George Gein died of heart failure at the age of 66, leaving Ed and Henry to manage the farm and care for their aging mother. It was around the time of George's death that the two brothers began doing odd jobs around town to help financially support the farm. The Gein brothers were considered to be trustworthy in the community, with some neighbors even hiring Ed to babysit their kids and take them out to the movies. Ed looked up to his older brother Henry and admired his strong character, but the two had many disagreements when it came to their mother, who tried to control every aspect of their lives. Henry was very outspoken against Augusta, and this created a lot of tension between him and his brother, who was now over 30 and completely dependent on their mother. The growing tension between the two brothers is often believed to have played a role in the strange and mysterious death of Henry, only four years after their father died. In the spring of 1944, Henry Gein died on the family's farm from what was officially ruled a heart attack, but the suspicious circumstances surrounding his death have led many people to believe Henry was Ed Gein's first victim. At the time of the alleged accident, Ed and his brother Henry were burning brush on the family's farm when the fire rapidly spread out of control, forcing them to run to safety, but Henry was never seen alive again. The fire was eventually extinguished, and Henry was later found face down in the brush, but his lifeless body wasn't burned from the fire. It was reported that bruising was seen in the back of Henry's head, and officials thought it was strange that Ed led them directly to the body after claiming he didn't know where he was. The bruising and odd circumstances were never fully investigated and the cause of death was officially ruled a heart attack and smoke inhalation. In 1945, only one year after Henry's mysterious death, Ed Gein's mother Augusta died at the age of 67 following a stroke. Despite Augusta's overbearing nature, Ed was completely devastated by her loss and pushed to the breaking point. Shortly after her death, he sealed off her bedroom to preserve it and began reading macabre books about headhunters and human anatomy, but those weren't the only things he was reading. Gein began reading obituaries in the newspaper, and in 1947, he started sneaking into local cemeteries at night to dig up the graves of middle-aged women who reminded him of his mother. 
Gein later confessed to making around 40 late-night visits to three different cemeteries and dug up the graves of at least 10 women who were brought back to his secluded farmhouse. Most of the grave robbing took place at Plainfield Cemetery, and what's even more disturbing is the fact that Ed Gein himself was later buried only a stone's throw away from three of the graves he once dug up. Right in front of Ed Gein's unmarked grave is the empty grave of Eleanor Adams, a 51-year-old woman Gein dug up the same day she was buried in 1951. Not far from Eleanor's grave is Marie Bergstrom and Mabel Everson, two more victims of Gein's twisted axe. The graves of both Eleanor and Mabel Everson were later exhumed by police and confirmed to be empty after Gein confessed to digging them up and stealing their bodies. It was also reported that Floyd Adams, Eleanor's husband, was present the day police exhumed her empty casket and he later sued the Gein estate for mental suffering. Although Gein stole most of the bodies from Plainfield Cemetery, the first grave he dug up was at Spiritland Cemetery in Almond, Wisconsin, less than 10 minutes away. Similar to Plainfield Cemetery, Spiritland is very secluded with many tall bushes and trees that Gein likely used as a hiding place to avoid detection. It was here, in 1947, that Ed Gein dug up Grace Beggs not long after she died. Beggs was the first grave Gein exhumed, but not the last from Spiritland. Nine years after digging up Grace Beggs and stealing bodies from two other cemeteries, Gein returned to Spiritland at night and dug up Alzada Abbott not far from Grace's grave. From 1947 to around 1956, Gein dug up the graves of at least 10 women in the middle of the night and never got caught, but his luck would eventually run out when he started murdering local women instead of digging them up. On the night of December 8, 1954, Ed Gein went to a nearby tavern owned by a middle-aged woman named Mary Hogan. Even though he wasn't much of a drinker, Ed had visited the tavern before, and it's believed he targeted Mary Hogan because she was German like his mother and bore a similar resemblance. On the night of her murder, he hid outside until all of the patrons left and Mary was alone inside. After everybody drove off, he walked into the tavern and when Mary Hogan told him they were about to close, he pulled out a gun and fired one fatal shot. He dragged her body to a sled he left outside and over the course of several hours, Gein pulled the sled all the way back to his farmhouse seven miles from the tavern. Without any witnesses or evidence linking Gein to the crime, the 1954 murder of Mary Hogan remained unsolved for three more years until he was arrested. Ed Gein's final murder victim was Bernice Warden, a 58-year-old woman who owned and operated Warden's Hardware in downtown Plainfield. On the morning of November 16, 1957, deer hunting season was officially open and most of the town's men were out hunting. It was on this morning that Ed Gein visited Warden's Hardware to purchase a jug of antifreeze. Upon entering, Gein quickly locked the door of the hardware store and asked to see a rifle displayed on the wall behind the register. After Bernice handed him the rifle, she turned around to look out the window and Ed loaded the gun with a bullet from his coat pocket. He ended her life with a single shot and dragged her out the back door to the hardware store's truck where he loaded the body into the vehicle. Later that day, Bernice's son Frank stopped by the store to check on his mother and was confused and concerned when he found the store locked with no one inside. Frank panicked and broke through the door only to find bloodstains on the floor and the cash register wide open with all of the money missing. A sales ledger on the counter showed the last item sold in the store that day was antifreeze and Ed Gein immediately became a suspect after Frank recalled him inquiring about the item the day before. Gein was tracked down and promptly arrested while having dinner at the home of Lester Hill, an old friend whose kids he frequently babysat. After his arrest on November 16, 1957, police descended upon Ed Gein's secluded farmhouse and discovered a true house of horrors that sent shockwaves through the nation. Washara County Sheriff Arthur Schley was the first to enter the woodshed out back and discovered the headless body of Bernice Warden hanging upside down by the ankles. Schley was said to have been so disturbed by the horrific discovery that he immediately ran outside the shed and vomited. Bernice Warden's head was later found in a burlap sack inside the house along with five others wrapped in plastic bags. Police also found the skin mask of Mary Hogan in a bag, soup bowls made out of skulls, and several items constructed from human remains. Having found so many human remains inside the house, police were convinced Gein killed multiple people and they didn't initially believe him when he confessed to stealing bodies from graves. The twisted crimes of Ed Gein were like no other and the townspeople were in complete shock and disbelief when they found out who was behind the heinous acts. 
The people of Plainfield thought Eddie Gein was quiet and a little odd, but overall he was considered to be trustworthy and willing to help a neighbor when asked to. He babysat their kids, helped them with odd jobs, and even had dinner with them. But little did they know, the shy, quiet man they were having dinner with was really a grave-robbing murderer who was secretly collecting body parts to furnish a house of horrors. Ed Gein confessed to stealing ten bodies from three cemeteries and even led investigators directly to the graves he dug up. After exhuming the empty caskets of at least three women, police left the remaining graves of the other victims alone. But sadly, due to the lack of DNA technology at the time, most of the remains found at the farmhouse could not be identified and returned to their proper graves. The remains of Mary Hogan and others found in Gein's home were said to be buried in an undisclosed mass grave in Plainfield Cemetery. It has been said that this headstone marks the mass grave for the remains found at the farmhouse in 1957. The grave may or may not be the final resting place of Mary Hogan and others. Ed Gein confessed to murdering Mary Hogan and Bernice Warden, who was buried in Plainfield Cemetery, not far from Gein himself, in the graves he dug up. Even though Gein admitted to killing both women, he was only tried for the murder of Bernice Warden and was ruled not guilty by reason of insanity in 1968. Gein was first sent to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Wappen, Wisconsin, but was eventually transferred to the Mendota State Hospital in Madison, where he died in 1984 at the age of 77. Ed Gein was buried in the family plot between his mother Augusta and brother Henry, less than 20 feet away from two of his grave robbery victims. In the early 2000s, Ed Gein's headstone was stolen, but it was eventually recovered and it's now locked away at the Plainfield Police Department to prevent further theft. The twisted story of Ed Gein shocked the nation and went on to inspire countless documentaries and horror movie characters like Norman Bates and Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs and the show Bates Motel were also inspired by the gruesome events in Plainfield. Gein was also believed to have been responsible for the disappearance of Evelyn Grace Hartley, Georgia Weckler, and two deer hunters who vanished while hunting on a farm near Gein's property. No evidence ever linked Gein to the disappearances, and the cases remain unsolved to this day. I've always found the story of Ed Gein to be truly terrifying, and visiting the crime scene locations for this video was an eerie experience to say the least. Uh, there's a few things I wanted to mention that I didn't point out earlier in the video that I thought were interesting, and I'll also share my thoughts on the case. Ed Gein's former house site was probably the most unsettling crime scene location uh, out of all of them other than the cemetery. Uh, and if you go there today, all that's left is a small building that looks like uh, maybe like a hunter shack or a storage shed. Uh, but that building actually appears in one of the black and white photos from 1957 when Ed Gein was arrested. Uh, if you look in this black and white photo, in the background you can see that building. Or what looks like the building. It looks almost identical. Um, you can see the same pine trees are in front of it. They're a lot taller now, obviously, but it looks like the same row of trees. And it's the same shape, that rectangular building with the doorway right in the center. Uh, it, it looks like back then uh, there was like maybe windows on the building. And then at some point later, maybe they put new siding on or built new walls. Who knows? But it does appear to be the same building. And it makes me wonder if that could be the woodshed where Bernice Warden's body was found hanging. Because uh, her body was found in the woodshed, according to the 1957 article I read. And so that, that is a possibility, unless there was uh, another building in back of the house somewhere where she was found, and then they tore that down. But I thought that was uh, interesting, and uh, I wanted to point that out. But when I was leaving the property... I was walking back to my car and I noticed there was something in the ditch right by Ed Gein's former driveway. And I walked over there and I noticed it was a skeleton. And when I looked closer, I could see that it appeared to be the skeleton of a deer. Uh, so probably what happened was is a hunter shot it, cleaned it, and then uh, threw the carcass there, probably on purpose to mess with people because they know people go out there. Uh, but I thought that was fitting to find a skeleton next to uh, Ed Gein's property. It was definitely strange. Visiting Plainfield Cemetery and the graves of the people involved in this tragic story was surreal. And it was truly mind-blowing to see how close Ed Gein's grave really is to the people he dug up. 
I mean, Eleanor Adams is right there. Marie Bergstrom is right there. Um, you know, Mabel Everson and Bernice Warden, who we murdered, are right there. I mean, they're all close to Ed Gein, and they're all in one general area in the back of the cemetery. And I think that's a real tragedy uh, that that was ever allowed to happen. You would think the cemetery would have never allowed that. I mean, it's just totally disrespectful to the families, knowing that, you know, this monster is buried next to the people that he dug up is just bizarre and wrong, in my opinion. And it sucks for other people that go there that have loved ones buried there and, you know, they don't have anything to do with it, but they're probably bothered by it knowing that that guy's buried in there. I wouldn't want to be buried in there. But there was rumors at one point that uh, Ed Gein was removed from the cemetery in secret and buried somewhere else. Um, I was unable to find any proof of that. I looked for like a newspaper article or something. Of course, the press probably wouldn't know about it, but I couldn't find anything that proves that he was actually removed from the cemetery. Uh, So he likely is uh, still buried between his mother and brother Henry. Um, People have taken the soil from his grave. As you can see, there's uh, like a small hole where some people have actually uh, taken his soil uh, as a souvenir. I don't know why you would want that. And then chipped away at his uh, mother's headstone as well. And people have often wondered if he ever dug up his mother. There's stories about him digging her up and then taking her back to the farmhouse, but there's no proof that that ever happened. It's also believed that he never did uh, because she was buried in a concrete vault and he wouldn't have been able to get to her. So uh, he likely never bothered to dig her up for that reason alone. There's, there's another story that says he tried but was unsuccessful, which it's possible. Uh, you would think maybe that could happen because uh, she's buried right by the other people he dug up. So, you know, maybe he did. Plus, you know, he was so obsessed with his mother. You would think if he was to dig up anyone, it would have been her. But as far as we know, he never dug her up. The other graves that he dug up, uh, he was able to take those bodies because none of them were buried in concrete vaults. They were uh, The caskets were all put inside wooden boxes. That's what I was able to find out. And it was really up to the cemetery back then whether they wanted to force people to bury them in a concrete vault or a wooden box. They left it up to the families, and I think a lot of it really probably came down to money. It was probably a lot cheaper uh, to bury someone in a wooden box, and they probably couldn't afford a concrete vault back then. Some families might have not had the money, so that's why they did that. And uh, I guess maybe it was more common, um, and he knew that, and so that's why he was able to break in with a crowbar and take the bodies. The police actually found his crowbar inside one of the caskets when they exhumed it to uh, check to see if it was really empty. I just think it's so disturbing that this guy was sneaking into cemeteries at night for a a span of 10 years and stealing bodies or parts of bodies. And I also read that he knew these people. He was friends with these people. If not all of them, he knew some of them. And so these could have been people that he did jobs for, he had dinner with, he could have watched their kids at one point, and then here he is digging them them up and mutilating their bodies. Uh, So it's uh, when you look at it like that especially, it's really scary. There was also other people that he dug up in uh, Plainfield Cemetery that I was unable to locate. There was Elsie Sparks and Harriet Sherman. I could not find their graves. I wandered around for a while, but I couldn't find them. And, and there might be one or two more people that he dug up in Plainfield, but I don't know their names. Uh, there's the mass grave that I mentioned um, that may or may not be uh, the grave where Mary Hogan's uh, remains and the other remains were uh, placed. Uh, according to find a grave, uh, one person says it's the mass grave and another person says it's not. And it's actually a memorial for, um, unknown soldiers. So that could be the case, but I didn't want to say conclusively if that's uh, the mass grave, but it is believed that, uh, Mary Hogan's remains are buried somewhere in the cemetery in an unmarked uh, plot. A lot of people think he's responsible for killing his brother, Henry. And I, I, I think the same. I think he probably did. I think it was sloppy police work. I think that if the police would have done a more thorough investigation, they could have uh, caught him back then, and all of these these other tragedies could have been avoided. Um, Nobody would have been dug up, and uh, Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan would have never been killed. Uh, So that's that's a big tragedy right there. Is that uh, you know that could have all of that stuff could have been avoided. I mean, I don't know if the bruising on the back of the head was real. That's what the story is, that he allegedly brought them to the bodies when he said he didn't know where he was. 
Uh, if all of that is true, then that all shows signs of just sloppy police work. It's also believed that he killed the two deer hunters that went missing near his property, which is, uh, I think is really, really strange. Um, uh, Victor Travis, and he's actually, there's a memorial for him in Hancock Cemetery, which is another cemetery that Gein robbed graves at, coincidentally. Um, I, I don't know the names of the graves he robbed in that cemetery. I didn't go there. Um, but there is a memorial for one of the deer hunters there. But leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts on Ed Gein. Do you think there's more murder victims than we know about? Do you think he dug up more graves than we know about? And do you think he killed his brother, Henry? And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out more of my scary videos now.